innovation matters. And a key part of innovation is entrepreneurship. We can help you accelerate your ideas. We can help you build your company by providing tools, advice, and networks. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Entrepreneurship 101. Mars's mission is to help grow the next generation of companies that will really be the foundation of our knowledge economy. And our focus is on creating relevant, real-time, contextual, experience-based learning opportunities for entrepreneurs that are in the process of building those companies. If you got that drive, and you have the passion, and you have the go-to attitude, guess what? Now you just have to go out there and do it. And by the end of this course, we're very confident in the fact you'll be able to go out there and execute on your plan. Entrepreneurship 101 is designed for people who are thinking about or just starting their business. This could be graduate or undergraduate students, scientists, researchers, aspiring social innovators, or even those that are 10-15 years into their career and just thinking, now is the time. It's a free 30-week program that happens every Wednesday at 6 at the Mars Centre and online via our live webcasts. I was sold on the quality of the delivery of the course and what they, they set out to do. I'd recommend 101 to anyone um, going forward with, with a new venture. We've grown from our beginnings with 20 grad students at U of T to becoming the largest live and online entrepreneurship education program in Canada with over 26,000 people tuning in last year. To hear a leading investor say what kinds of things they're looking for and give you real advice that was eye-opening for us. We had no idea about those kinds of things. Entrepreneurship 101 is practical business education designed by entrepreneurs for entrepreneurs. The lecture topics cover all the fundamentals of starting a business to give you an overview of what you really need to know when you're starting out. You'll also have the chance to hear from several well-known entrepreneurs who will tell you what it's really like and inspire you to achieve your goals with their stories of success. The most valuable part of Entrepreneurship 101, I would say, was getting to hear such great speakers speak on a variety of topics. And at our Meet the Entrepreneurs events, you'll have the opportunity to meet and connect with other entrepreneurs in your space. So Entrepreneurship 101 is really that, uh, that foundational layer that we wanted to build that would not only connect the community into the resources of Mars, but would begin to, to lay the groundwork for a long-term robust entrepreneurship uh, community in, in Ontario. Entrepreneurship 101 is just the start. Check out our other events and our online resources available in the Entrepreneur's Toolkit. There you'll find hundreds of videos, articles, and useful workbooks that can help you grow your business. You do those things, you're going to be successful in any market. Welcome everyone to Entrepreneurship 101 and to the Mars Center, if you're a first time visitor here. Uh, you saw me in the video, I don't always wear this blazer, but it's my favorite one right now. Um, it's my new fall blazer. Um, my name is Carrie Damon, I'm the Director of Entrepreneurship Programs at Mars, and I'm really delighted to welcome you tonight to the ninth year of our Entrepreneurship 101 program. Joining us tonight, it's, we've got a full house here of uh, 400 plus, um, probably about 100 outside. We also have three satellite centers on the webcast that I would like to welcome. We've got Innovation Factory in Hamilton watching, so hello Hamilton. We've got uh, NORCAT in Sudbury has a group together watching, so uh, hello to them as well. And Hall Tech in Halton um, is also participating in the program, but they're doing it a little different. Um, they're meeting at other times than the live uh, presentation. So I'll explain actually who those partners are because they're involved in the innovation space a little bit later. Uh, but before I kick off, um, I did want to acknowledge the support that CIBC, our sponsor, and CIBC has been a sponsor for uh, seven years since Entrepreneurship 101 was very small and they've just renewed for three years. So we're so grateful to receive continuing support from CIBC. Um, a sincere thanks to Joan Peters, the Director of Community Investment, and David McGowan, the Vice President of Government Relations. So please warm, warm uh, applause for them. It's nice to have a free, uh, very comprehensive program to help entrepreneurship in Ontario. So, Before I get started, I wanted to find out who you guys are. So who here, this is your first time in the Mars Centre, can you put your hand up? Wow. Who has never been in the Mars Centre before or heard of it before Entrepreneurship 101? Okay, smaller. Who is just here because entrepreneurship is just kind of interesting, you don't really know that much about it. You're just testing out the waters. Who's, who has a million ideas and doesn't know where to start? 
All right, we love you guys, serial entrepreneurs. Who is just starting on one idea, just getting into kind of working on it? Good work. Wow, so we've got a real mix here. I think it's interesting to know that we do a survey at the end of the year. And while we do have a lot of aspiring entrepreneurs, by the end of the year, the participants that filled out the survey, about 60 of them said that this was, uh, they were starting to work on their business. And of course, um, this is a passive lecture series, so we do encourage you to get out there and work on your business um, along the way. So with that, um, so the way Mars thinks, to Mars, I um, just want to see if the slides work. The future matters. Our future matters. And that future is increasingly becoming very complex. There's full of lots of rapid technological change. There's globalization. There's uh, evolving and sometimes complete revolutions happening in industries. So it's a real time of uncertainty. So the quality of that future to us depends on innovation. To make sure that Canada stays, we retain the wealth that we have created um, and position ourselves well going forward. When we think about innovation, um, it's, a, it's a buzzword used almost by everybody nowadays. But to us, it means solving problems, problems sometimes that we don't even know, we, we're not even having yet. So it's keeping on the cutting edge of bringing systems together to solve problems, using technology to solve problems, um, and other methods of collaboration and, and ways of thinking and being that can solve problems. So for us, innovation matters. And a key part of innovation is entrepreneurship. If you think about uh, the celebrated entrepreneurs in the news, um, they are all, Steve Jobs is, is you know, the one that comes to mind like immediately. And of course, he's no, a known innovator and entrepreneur. So we know that entrepreneurship matters to this future and to this, the innovation that our future needs. But even more deep than that is the entrepreneur. The entrepreneur matters, so the talent. And that's why we're so happy that you're here tonight. Because the entrepreneurs, the, it's the people that create the innovation um, that will ensure our future. So you matter very much to this future. And we're so happy that you, you've taken this first step or you're continuing your journey um, um, in entrepreneurship. So the quality of the future depends on you. So tonight's agenda, I'm going to talk a little bit more about why entrepreneurship matters. We'll talk about Mars um, to those, because to, there's a number of people that this is their first time here. We'll talk about what entrepreneurship is, and we'll talk about the entrepreneurial mindset and do you have what it takes. I'm always really fascinated by these studies where they try to bottle the brain of the entrepreneur and see if we can just um, somehow replicate that in our youth. Uh, we'll talk about the course, of course. We're going to talk about my favorite day of the year, the Upstart competition, which is the pitch competition at the end of the course. It's always really fun. We'll talk about some other resources that you can access along the way. And uh, we'll get into finding and validating your idea, because I want to plant the seed of where you find the idea and how you begin to validate it. And lastly, we're going to talk about stamp cards. So, um, when, you, when you leave today, you'll get a stamp card. It's to uh, help us register attendance. Um, get it stamped every week, and, and that's how we can uh, know that you're here live for um, purposes of the certificate or um, the Upstart competition. So we're going to start with a video from Dennis Whittle um, and the Kauffman Foundation on why entrepreneurship matters. Entrepreneurs do three things. They birth the new in a simple way. That is to say, every type of innovation we have has largely come from people thinking innovatively, and most of them come from firms that were created to bring forth this new technology that the inventor entrepreneur thought up. The second thing they do is even much more important, and that is when new firms are started, they create jobs. This is actually quite apparent, but economists and policymakers and politicians don't get this. You know, if you're running General Electric or General Motors, your stockholders want higher productivity. They want more product coming out for less expense. It's a simple equation. It's the amount of product divided by the number of people who work in the company. And if you're the president of one of those companies, your job is to drive that number on the denominator down. You want fewer people. Well, if you start a brand new company and you're going to make something, you're going to deliver a service or a product, 
got to have people. So you don't want to have more employees than necessary. But without employees, you've got nothing. So new firms hire. And in fact, the statistics from the Kauffman Foundation tell us that new firms are the place where all new hiring takes place, the net job creation. And it's not a small number. On average, new firms in the United States create about 3 million jobs a year. In fact, at the margin, that is where all the jobs are that are created in the economy that are, that are new, it's new firms that do it. Put differently, the United States, unlike a lot of countries, has a growing population, has a growing labor force. We need 3 million brand new jobs every year. That's if everybody else kept their job. With the entry of young people, with the coming of immigrants, with people returning to the labor market, we need 3 million new jobs every year. And those jobs are the vast preponderance. Almost all of them come in firms that are less than five years old. Now, the third thing that entrepreneurs do with their new companies is they create all the new net wealth in the society. So if we didn't have new companies, the society would gradually grow in relative terms poorer. Now, we think about entrepreneurs as actually sometimes becoming very rich. We have in mind Steve Jobs or Bill Gates or Sergey Brin. These guys get very, very wealthy. But in fact, the real wealth goes into the society. It's estimated that the people who start these firms take a fraction, in some cases less than a percent, of all the new net wealth that their companies generate for the society. Think about what Bill Gates did with Microsoft. Now, he made a fortune for himself, tens of billions of dollars. But he's made every one of us richer in economic terms. We are all much better off. So these are all the things that entrepreneurs do. They keep pushing the innovative, they push the new, they make jobs for people, and they make wealth for the society. America and the world will, as long as human beings walk this planet, need innovators, need inventors, need entrepreneurs. So I love that video because it shows in a really small uh, frame of time that all the, the things that why entrepreneurship matters. Not only does it make your life better, it makes the um, societies uh, more productive, creates jobs. So basically it drives productivity and global competitiveness. And it's really, we're, we're almost in a bubble right now where it seems like entrepreneurship is everywhere. Um, and I think it shows the importance that all societies in different countries are putting a lot of effort into entrepreneurship to ensure that they're globally competitive in the future. As, as the video mentioned, the majority of new jobs in modern economies are created by firms that are less than five years old. And about of, of those firms, about four to 10%, depends on the country, are the ones that become the high growth firms. They create the most new jobs and they create them faster. So you can see what happened with RIM. RIM is a perfect example of a high growth, uh, high growth film firm. It grew very fast, even internationally. And while it's been a really bad week for RIM and it's going, it's cutting jobs, a lot of the startups actually in Waterloo are quite excited that all this talent has been released and it's, they're, they're able to use the talent. So not only does the firm itself create jobs and, and intellectual property and patents and innovation, it creates talent. So that talent can be reused. So I try to be positive about what's happened with BlackBerry and think, you know, there's a lot of great talent that's just been unleashed into our startup space, both in Waterloo and Toronto. So the point, young, high growth firms create the majority of new jobs in modern economies. And that leads us to why uh, Mars exists and who we are. So we're focused on creating the next generation of Canadian entrepreneurs. We help entrepreneurs start and grow businesses. Um, to create the jobs of tomorrow. So we are a nonprofit charity uh, because our social purpose is to create jobs. And the way we think of ourselves is kind of like an innovation center that's like a neutral sandbox. So we're connecting different communities, science, business, capital, to improve the efficiency and the output of the commercialization process. There's a lot of really fantastic research that goes on around this area. The Discovery District part of our name um, represents that. Um, we are networked to our partners. Some of the, our partners are watching us tonight around the province. There's 16 regional innovation centers doing great work um, as far north as Sudbury, Ottawa, Waterloo, uh, London, North Bay. And increasingly, we're becoming more and more connected globally. The convergence innovation is how we describe that combining of the communities, the science, business, and capital. And that's what the three flags in our atrium stand for. This, this photo actually looks really old, really fast now, because 
on the weekend, I don't know if you noticed the large building that was built, is being built on this corner. Um, they just blew through the, the fake wall or the temporary wall. So we're pretty excited about it because it's going to connect us to the subway and we're going to have all this extra space in what we call phase two. So the place we're in right now is actually a really special building. We're pretty lucky to be here. This is the building 100 years ago, a picture we found in the archives. And it was the Toronto General Hospital. Um, and it is the birthplace of a number of really amazing innovations. Probably the most famous one is that the first preclinical trials of insulin actually happened in this building. So who knows somebody here with diabetes? Yay! So we know that diabetes is, is, you know, very common actually nowadays and insulin is a tremendous innovation, but that's not all. There's a lot actually that has happened here and is happening in this area. So here's the building today and, and our new extension um, is on the right. What is also special, not only the building, um, which we officially bought in 2000 and then opened in 2005, so we've been around about eight years now, um, or sorry, we opened in 2005, so we've been opening it for eight years, um, is, is the location that we're in. We're really lucky to be in downtown Toronto, so there's major research hospitals nearby. University of Toronto is the biggest research um, university in Canada, so you've got tremendous amount of research and innovation happening in this area. I think the latest number I heard was $1.2 billion worth of research happens in, in a number of blocks around here. So there's tons of innovations happening. It's our challenge is getting those innovations to market faster. In the Mars Center itself, this building is uh, called the Mars Center. We uh, have a number of tenants. There's about 80, 80 different organizations. It's a mix of public and private. On the private side, we've got everything from two spaces that are incubator spaces. One is sort of more for life sciences companies. It has labs and another one sort of the open concept. Um, for IT companies, it's called the Mars Commons. We also have a number of public organizations that are also involved in the innovation space. And again, this, the building itself is meant to be, um, to bring these communities together, to get them talking and connecting, to sort of foster um, the collisions that we hope um, accelerate innovation. So how do we help entrepreneurs? Um, if this is sort of a funnel, it's not n probably not this neat in reality but you've experienced the wide mouth of the funnel. This is entrepreneurship education, and this is actually what my team does, and we'll talk more about exactly what that entails. Um, we also have advisors and uh, a market intelligence team that work with clients, and I'll talk a little bit about that. And at the, the sort of the farthest end, so the most developed companies or the, the most high potential companies have access to some funding sources and, and investors. So the entrepreneurship programs. The entrepreneurship programs at Mars, uh, we're going to talk later about whether or not entrepreneurship can be taught. Obviously, um, I might have an opinion on that. Uh, but we've built a lot of resources to accelerate people's businesses. So we have events such as Entrepreneurship 101. We have online resources that I'm going to talk about. And we have workshops which are very kind of experiential, entrepreneurs develop business components. And our idea was that entrepreneurs don't want to be taught, per se, but they want tools. They want access to tools to solve their problem, to build what they need to build when they need to build it. So we're pretty active. As I mentioned, we're networked across the province. So we have, my team alone has about 60 events um, with about 11,000 attendees. And if we add our provincial workshops that we're doing with our partner organizations, it's about um, another 120. We have a lot of online resources. This is being made into a video that will be online, so you can access this and other uh, programs online at any time. When I look around, we are actually the largest and most comprehensive entrepreneurship education in the world. Um, some people have videos, some people have articles, but nobody has sort of the, the entire suite that I've discovered so far. Um, a little bit on our uh, entrepreneurship and innovation series. If this is your first time to Mars and you're not on like our email uh, list, there are tons of events that happen in this building. Some of them are ours. Um, some of them are uh, sort of partners and people in the space. If you're interested, sign up on the f sort of the homepage of Mars for the email distribution list. It's a weekly email. Tons of events. Um, and, and we list partner events and our own. Of, the t of what we do for entrepreneurship education, obviously Entrepreneurship 101 is one of our events. Our intermediate event series that we'll talk about a lot is Mars Best Practices. It's small group, um, 40 people, 90 minutes, much more conversational. Um, it's more 
for practical advice and questions about how to do things. We also have Mars Market Insights. It goes uh, with our market intelligence team. We um, take a deep dive into different um, rapidly evolving sectors and talk about what's happening in the space. We bring in social innovation and other global leaders for our Mars Global Leadership Program. We have a startup book club, if you love to read the innovation books. And we have a youth program, if you know anybody between the ages of 13 and 15, or actually next summer, 16 and 18 too, uh, that wants to do a five day boot camp, it's super fun in entrepreneurship. And we have our workshops, which I'll talk about. On the online resources side, um, I'll talk a little bit more about them later. Um, they were in the video, so I think you already know about them. So that's entrepreneurship education. Next is sort of, the next sort of area of Mars is becoming a client and working with the business advisory services. So we work in four different uh, sectors, healthcare and life sciences, ICT, which we call ICE, uh, information technology, communications and entertainment, clean tech and advanced materials, and social innovation. Increasingly, we're viewing social innovation as a thread that sort of underlies all the sectors rather than an official separate sector. Uh, but I want to mention it in case it's new to, to some people here. We have, we have full-time Mars advisors. We have entrepreneurs and residents we call EIRs. Uh, we have many, many volunteer advisors. And actually, that's what, how we do the majority of our advisory services is through really um, experienced entrepreneurs and executives who work with um, our entrepreneurs. They provide all kinds of support. It depends on what stage, what stage you're in. When you come into Mars, um, you fill out an application form, you have an intake meeting, and they sort of match you with an advisor if you're in a certain stage. If you want to look at sort of what our breakdown is, I think there's a, there's, because we're located towards the hospitals and there's a lot of life sciences companies in this building, I think a lot of people think we just work with life sciences and healthcare companies, but actually um, they're, second smallest sector, they're 17%. Um, the biggest is the information, technology, communications, and entertainment, it's almost half. Um, clean tech has is, is been interesting watching it um, evolve over the years. It used to be like nothing, and it's sort of rocketing up to, it's now 18%. Uh, materials and advanced manufacturing, and that social innovation or social purpose is about 40%. So we're working with about 1,200 active clients at any time, and about 65% of them are in the GTA. I know you're going to have lots of questions about the advisory services, so um, it's probably not the best to ask me. Uh, I think there's a better way, and we have a Mars client info session happening next week, uh, October 3rd from 537. And the reason why I say it's good to go to that is because you can talk to an associate if you're in any of those sectors, um, specifically about the kind of services that they can offer you. They'll just give you a more in-depth um, answer than I will. So please register if you want to come to that, marsdd.com slash info session. It's a great uh, opportunity to meet and learn more about our programs. Um, having said that, so if you're not in the technology space or you're not in the social innovation space after I explain that the, the client services at Mars work with those areas, if you're just Main Street entrepreneurship, I still encourage you to take uh, advantage of a lot of our entrepreneurship education programs such as Entrepreneurship 101. A lot of it's business fundamentals, it applies across the board, you can meet other entrepreneurs, it's free, it's high value. So um, even if the advisory services are, it's not, we're not in the same space, we have, we have wonderful resources that I encourage you to take advantage of. So what is entrepreneurship? I think even when I was, uh, when I was young, um, my family is entrepreneurial, and I don't think they ever would have said, I'm an entrepreneur. They used to say, I'm, I'm a business owner, you know, we own this or we own that. Um, so I think it's, it's, it's something that's, it used to be seen as quite rogue, but it's become quite mainstream. But not everybody identifies as being an entrepreneur. I, I notice women especially will say that they're, you know, they, they have their own business or they're small business owners. They don't always say, I'm an entrepreneur. But it's changing. It's, because, it's becoming quite cool. So if we look at what is entrepreneurship, Entrepreneurship, the, what, the uh, definition I like best is that individuals, they identify opportunities, they allocate resources, and they create value for, through the identification of unmet needs or opportunities. It sounds simple, but it's actually quite difficult, especially that value part, and uh, especially the unmet needs. Um, if you want to add a layer and under, to understand what social entrepreneurship is, uh, social entrepreneurship, lots of different definitions. Here, this is just one 
It's identifying a social problem and using entrepreneurial principles to organize, create, and manage a venture to make social change. The easiest way to explain what social entrepreneurship is, it's basically triple bottom line. So it could be a nonprofit, but increasingly it, it is a business, like a regular business, that wants to make a social impact. So whether the product itself helps society, the inputs to the product, they're hiring low-skilled workers or workers that don't have great opportunity, or they're using recycled materials, that kind of thing. There's, there's so many ways to be a social um, innovation, but basically it has another lens that it's looking at um, in addition to just making a profit. Peter Drucker is a famous management theorist. Um, if you're not familiar with him, he's really great, actually. Um, and his quote is, the purpose of a business is to find and serve customers profitably. And what I like about this definition is that he doesn't say, build a better product, sell it cheaper, um, get better distributors, or all the things we kind of get in the muck with businesses. And, and, and we see it all the time with entrepreneurs. They say, this is the best laser on the market, or will be. This is the best product, and they think, I'm just going to build the best product, and my sales forecast is going to go like hockey stick. It's going to go whoosh. Um, and we see that all the time, because if you're an entrepreneur, you believe in your vision. You believe in your product. You believe in your technology. But you can get blinded um, by thinking that it's just so great, the technology is so great, I'm just going to put it on the market, and everyone's going to snap it up. Um, what I hope this course will convince you of is that it's really important. Oh, I feel so like I'm neglecting you guys. So I said, I've got to move over here. Sorry. Um, is, is to really focus on the customer. And we're going to talk about that when I talk about finding and validating um, an idea. And I think some of the changes that have really happened in entrepreneurship education, in, especially in the last couple of years, is getting people out of the building earlier to go talk to customers. Um, before, it was kind of like people would do stuff, especially around 2000, 2001, it was all about stealth mode. Eh? We used to, you don't even talk about stealth mode anymore. It's like, I want to build something secretly. I might do a, you know, a quiet beta with some trusted people, and then I'm going to launch it. But increasingly, entrepreneurship is changing, and they're saying, get out, show your product in an earlier stage to customers, get their feedback. It'll help you um, reduce your risk and make a better product. So now that we know what entrepreneurship is, let's talk about the entrepreneur, the entrepreneurial mindset. Um, we, have a lot of, uh, we have a lot of worship of entrepreneurs in the media. Uh, Richard Branson, Steve Jobs, you hear about them all the time. And they're these grand visionaries, these, these, these guys that just see opportunity and are able to really capitalize on it. Um, there are some real strengths to entrepreneurs that I'm going to talk about based on some studies. But I also want to to um, put some context around that it isn't just the entrepreneur. Um, Richard Branson has an inter interesting strategy. He just decides that his whole strategy is, I'm just going to go into whatever industry I decide that has crappy customer service, and I'm just going to improve it. So he has one strategy, and he's the visionary, and he just hires the right people to sort of execute on that. Um, I met somebody the last time I was in Silicon Valley that worked with Steve Jobs sort of before he got fired and then after at Apple. So he was on both sides. And he said, you know, if you asked anybody at Apple, um, you know, was this all Steve Jobs' his glory, all his vision? Is he the reason for that? And he said, they'd say, no, he hires really, really good people. He hires the best designers. He has the best talent. And of course, once he's making these cool products, he also has the best talent flocking towards him. So even though I'm, we're going to talk about the entrepreneurial mindset, and we're going to say, wow, they're so great at this, and they're so wonderful at this, I just want to put that context that um, we do sort of worship entrepreneurs as like it, they're the only reason the business is successful, but it's often a team. And Steve Jobs is a perfect example. There were two Steves. There was Steve Wozniak, who was tinkering in the garage, loved the technology, hobbyist, making it for fun. And Steve Jobs, that was the visionary that said, we can sell this, this can change the world, and I'm going to market it for you. So while I love quotes like this, if people aren't calling you crazy, you aren't thinking big enough, um, I think uh, there's a lot of good people behind that. So there was a meta study that I liked that was called Five Minds for the Entrepreneurial Future. And it sort of looked at millions, well not millions, but a lot of studies and, and for trends. What is this entrepreneurial mindset? Who are these entrepreneurs? Um, how are they different from regular people? And these are the five, the five trends they found. The first one is that entrepreneurs have an opportunity-recognizing mind. 
And if anybody knows an entrepreneur, um, they, especially a real serial entrepreneur, they have the curse of too many ideas because they go out and they see opportunities everywhere. They sort of see how things can change and they look at the world through almost a different lens. They have a designing mind. If you think about traditional business school, what do they teach? They teach you marketing, finance, accounting. It's all kind of in buckets. But if you want to be an entrepreneur, you almost have to uh, combine those buckets together, design a business with kind of everything in mind at the same time. Um, people always say, you know, uh, what do I do first and second and third kind of like for us with entrepreneurship? And, um, you know, and we, we do have an order to these lectures and they're kind of in modules, but it's a false, it's kind of a fake order because you're going to have to be thinking about almost everything all the time to a certain extent. So you're going to have to bring together a lot of different subject areas and a lot of different um, ways of thinking to have that designing mind. Uh, we think of entrepreneurs as risk takers. This study would argue that they are skilled risk managers. They're able to look ahead, even if it's a couple weeks, two months, and see what, the risks are, what risks are coming and adapt for them. And I think that's a really valuable trait, especially in today's world, which is just getting faster and more chaotic. The ability to, to take risks and to manage them. Their resilience, I don't think this is a surprise to anybody. Um, entrepreneurship is tremendously difficult. I have a couple friends that are just on the tail end of two years or three in another case of hell, basically, trying to get the first customer. One has about 10 now. They're doing really well. Um, and they're starting to breathe. But they used to have like panic attacks about revenue. Where am I going to make money? When am I going to make money? You know? And so it is, we don't want to, you know, make it seem like it's all wonderful and everybody's going to be a superstar. It is tough. Entrepreneurs are resilient. They can handle ups and downs. They, they can handle failure. They stick to their vision. And lastly, there's a, they, they notice that entrepreneurs have an effectuating mind. And what this means is they're very action oriented. So entrepreneurs are not ones to sit and read a textbook on product development and then build a product. They're tinkering and building all the time. They're not one to write a big, long business plan and then execute it perfectly. They might go and do a little bit here and a little bit there and sort of test what their business model should be. Another study that I wanted to highlight that I thought was really interesting because it was the only one I can ever find because I think there's this, this worship of entrepreneurs happening right now that said what their weaknesses might be. So here are, it's a control group of 17,000 working adults and they compared them to serial entrepreneurs. So no surprise, serial entrepreneurs better at persuasion. That's great because if you've got to sell, especially products, new products to um, new customers, that's, that'll help you. Leadership, personal accountability, goal orientation, also really good. That means they set and achieve their goals. They tend to be good at interpersonal skills, which is, which is great as well uh, because people do business with people they like. Where they weren't as strong as the control group were things like analytical problem solving, empathy, planning and organizing, and self-management. Does anybody work for an entrepreneur? You're laughing, right? Yeah. So analytical problem solving, you, I kind of get this and I kind of get how it works, right? If an, if an entrepreneur is down in the weeds, they're not going to stick to the vision. They're not going to stick to the goal orientation and stuff. So in a way, it almost works in the beginning. It could, it could make, them, make them you crazy to work with them because um, there's all this data and they're not doing, doing anything with it. Uh, they're lower on planning and organizing. Um, and, and self-management as well. But I think it's good to realize these things and see, is this something that you see in yourself? Because as the business gets bigger, you just realize that, okay, I'm not great at analyzing or planning and organizing. That's when you hire somebody to look after that stuff and you stick to the vision and the goal setting and that kind of stuff. So if in one, um, shout out what you think motivates entrepreneurs. Finishing? Finishing? Freedom, that's a good one. Innovation. Sorry? Innovation. Innovation? Passion. Passion? Impact. Impact. Oh, there's a winner. We have a winner. So I, I was surprised. This is from the Startup Genome Report. Uh, this is actually tech entrepreneurs. But what motivates entrepreneurs? 70% said impact. Only 5% said money. So that's really surprising because you sort of think entrepreneurs, um, I think they want money or freedom, basically. Um, and, and experience. 
They want the experience. What's interesting is we did a study of our, our clients here, and we found actually the same thing, that about 70% of them um, were thought of themselves or were motivated by impact. So it's a really important motivator for entrepreneurs. They want to make a difference. And the entrepreneur's oath, I will fail and fail again until I succeed. So I think to be an entrepreneur, you have to develop a new relationship with failure. Failure becomes your friend. You're not afraid of failure. It's a learning tool. Um, if this scares you, entrepreneurship might not be the space for you. Um, but I think that sometimes you can embrace failure as uh, saving you time going in the wrong direction. So the billion dollar question, can entrepreneurship be taught? My favorite Peter Drucker, most of what you hear about entrepreneurship is all wrong. It's not magic, it's not mysterious, and has nothing to do with genes. It's a discipline, and like any discipline, it can be learned. So Ernst & Young had a, had a study last year, it was for their Entrepreneur of the Year um, award, and they asked a bunch of entrepreneurs um, how they became entrepreneurs. And they found of the 100% or like the whole group of entrepreneurs, about 60% of them were transitioned entrepreneurs, meaning they came from work, the work world. Um, and of those, so they didn't, they weren't entrepreneurs to start with, so it's not necessarily that entrepreneurship, you're born an entrepreneur. It happened later. In fact, the average age of entrepreneurs is usually 40, which you would think was a risky time to start a business, actually, probably among the riskiest. You might have a mortgage, you might have smaller kids. Um, you're just getting into your career and, and doing really well at that age, mostly. Um, but no, that's the age that, that, that people start. And it's because they have experience. So this, this study of, of Ernst & Young, they found, you know, what was the, they asked what was the most important factor in becoming an entrepreneur. About one third said the experience I learned in the work world. One third said what I learned in school. And the other third said what I learned from mentors. So you'll notice it's all learning. So you're either learning from your community, learning from your experience, or learning from school. So I really do believe that there's a significant power of, of learning that can help people become entrepreneurs. So entrepreneurship education has really changed. I worked for an entrepreneur in Holland that had started 51 companies. He liked to say that only 17 were failures. And he was like Richard Branson. He, all he would do is just nail out, just ideas out, and just had really good people executing them. Um, he was on a tirade against business plans. He said, you know, I have never had a business plan that had any truth in it. They're just, they're just not, they're just fake, false. I wanted to say a bad word, but. Um, so, and, and this has become an increasingly uh, valued. So for a long time, business schools would teach, uh, you do a lot of market research, then you build a business plan, then you build a pitch, and then you, build, you go to investors. But we've learned that business plans rarely survive their first contact with the market. Uh, and long-range forecasts, in many cases, they're just fiction. Because you're, you're operating in an area of uncertainty. People don't know you, they don't know your product. Um, how can you predict that, oh, just because the market that you're selling to is 1% of the entire market, that's going to make X amount of, it's all assumptions. Um, another thing that we've learned that's really changed entrepreneurship education is that startups are not smaller versions of large companies. And what this means is, even when a big company makes a product, they kind of know who their target market is. They've developed a lot, of, a lot of knowledge about who they're selling to, who likes their brand. It's completely different. Whereas a startup is searching for a business model. It's not clear what they're making, who they're selling to. It changes all the time. And if you follow, um, we'll, talk, we'll talk more in the course about some of the sort of gurus in the space, and that's number three, is some of those new tools and technologies have been designed sp specifically for startups to help them do this searching for a business model. And we'll talk about that a little bit more when we talk about um, how to validate your idea. But basically, it it's the, goes back to when I was saying you gotta get out of the building and talk to customers early on. So a perfect example, we did this with our future leaders in, in the summer, these 13 to 15 year olds. So we had them brainstorm some, some problems they saw in society. And then we had them brainstorm some solutions. And then we had them go around the building to kind of like advisors and entrepreneurs that we, that we know and ask, you know, is this something that's really important? Is this a problem you're willing to pay for? Um, is this a solution you like? And they asked a lot of questions and they were, came back and they had had a couple different ideas that they were out testing. And they came back and they're like, wow, it was really like nobody, the problem that we thought was so big and people would pay for, they didn't like that, but they liked this other one. So their validation of their idea was full of surprises. 
But that's just a microcosm, what an entrepreneur does in real life on a much bigger scale over many more months, is that you have to search for your business model, what you're selling and to who and, to who, and do they want it, and how your product and market fit. Another thing that's changed about entrepreneurship education is there's, people are trying to study it. They're trying to make it more scientific. So if you think of this idea of going out and talking to your market and validating your idea, it's, it's very much more akin to science than business has ever been in some ways. Um, we're also, there's the Startup Genome uh, Project. If you are interested in the space, definitely download this report and read it. It's really interesting. They, they studied a whole bunch of uh, companies and actually the, only the four stages, discovery, validation, efficiency, and scaling are theirs. I, I added this, the ideation. Actually, I got this from clean tech, but um, ideation is kind of, we deal with a lot of entrepreneurs in the ideation stage, which is just thinking about the idea. So the startup genome found that there's a discovery stage where you're, um, the value of the innovation is assessed. That's when you're out talking to customers and your market, getting more information. There's um, a validation stage where you're getting your first customer, so you're actually making sales. Efficiency when you're refining the business model and growing your process in order to um, scale which is where your growth is aggressive. And what's great about this stuff is they're identifying the needs of entrepreneurs at different stages and able to compare who's doing more successful or um, what leads to more successful things. And what's interesting, I was just looking at it again recently, uh, entrepreneurs usually say the hardest part of being an entrepreneur is not the product, which you think it would be. It's all this other stuff of validating the idea and... Uh, it's not even funding, it's not often, it's, it's that product market fit. Um, another way to show that entrepreneurship can be learned, this is also from the startup genome, is the impact of mentors. So you can see um, how much money was raised over the, those stages below, and you can see at a certain stage, if you had helpful mentors, you raised money more. So they're showing the impact of, of tapping into a community of expertise. It can be tough because you'll have advisors that will be telling you conflicting information, so as an entrepreneur, you kind of got to know what, when to listen and, and when not to. But definitely, you need a community around you um, to help grow your business. So again, I want to go back to this idea. We'll revisit it in about, uh, I think, three weeks' time in the um, entrepreneurial management course that searching for a business model, which is what startups do, is different than executing against one, what established businesses do. The lean definition of a startup is that it's a temporary organization designed to search for a repeatable and scalable business model. And if you follow, um, if you know entrepreneurs, you know that every three months they've sort of tweaked it or pivoted and they're, they're, they're like, wow, well, we went to this target market and they weren't that interested, but then I randomly ended up talking to somebody in this market and they really liked our product. That's that pivot, that, that validating and what we call customer development, trying to figure out where your product belongs. So how can this course help you? So obviously we can't create entrepreneurial drive, but you're here, so you're interested. That desire comes from you. What we can do is we can help you accelerate your ideas. We can help you build your company by, by providing tools, advice, and networks. Lots of events around Mars, lots of chance to meet other entrepreneurs, lots of tools online or you know, through the advisory services, there is advice. And lastly, the course. So I'm just gonna whip through this because I'm sure you picked up the, the course um, sheet at the registration desk. So it's a 30-week course. We have 23 lectures on business topics, and we've got two lived-it lectures that are our sort of big celebrated entrepreneurs, which are always really fun. Um, we like to meet the entrepreneurs, the, our clients that are really cool and building their company now. So you're gonna hear from celebrated entrepreneurs, you're gonna hear from ones in startup as well to get the, the real experience and uh, those are always popular events. We actually had to extend them to an hour and a half because they get so many questions. Um, we also have at the end the Upstart competition. So next week we have a lived it lecture with Dan Martell. Uh, he is a serial entrepreneur and investor, uh, currently the founder and CEO of Clarity. He's flying from New Brunswick um, to see us so we're pretty excited about him coming. Uh, I've heard him speak before. I don't know if people know him here, but he's really dynamic. I really recommend him, so hopefully you'll come next week. We have five different modules. Uh, we, the journey begins, model, market, management, and money. The, the journey begins is just sort of all the things you need to think about in the beginning. Think about your idea, 
think about what kind of structure, different types of entrepreneurship, we'll talk about social innovation, non-profits, for-profits, figure out incorporation, that kind of stuff. Nuts and bolts of starting a business, it's kind of basically startup law, things you need to consider. Uh, introduction to entrepreneurial management, we're going to get back to this lean startup and customer development and thinking about getting out and talking to your customers early. Value proposition, a centerpiece of any business, what is the value that you provide to your customer in one clear sentence, and product development. Model, how you'll make money, we're going to talk about intellectual property management, um, applies probably to a greater degree to some sectors, uh, patents, copyrights, trademarks, that sorts of things. Talk about business models and the business model canvas, which is a great tool to help you test the business model as we were talking about. And we'll talk about business plans. They haven't died yet. The business plan is not dead. Um, it's, it's changed a bit and it has some, some uses like for investors and other stakeholders. Market, very important. Targeting your market and selling. We're gonna talk about market intelligence, marketing communications, go-to-market strategy, B2B sales and negotiations. We're also going to talk about management, um, talk about board of advisors, board of uh, governance, financial planning, which is basically budgeting, managing your money to get you to the milestones, recruiting, and entrepreneurial leadership. It's a new lecture this year, from, um, which will be really great. And last module is money. Bootstrapping, which if you're not familiar with the term, basically means self-funding. So you might be off selling services as a consultant or something that funds your product, or there's something happening, uh, you've got friends and family or um, the three Fs fools that are, that are f funding you. Um, we'll also talk with investors, terms of investment. We're going to talk about impact investing, uh, raising money from VCs. We'll have a panel of VCs to really tell it like it is. And at the end, we have our last lecture is about the pitch and what goes into a great pitch. So there's a number of ways you can follow Entrepreneurship 101. Obviously, you can attend live. Um, on your way out, you'll get a stamp card that has the first stamp on it. Just bring that every week. Uh, if you attend 20, 20 uh, lectures, we'll give you a certificate at the end. You also need 20 to, um, to apply for the Upstart competition. You can watch this on the live webcasts. Um, which also are archived, so you can watch those later. You can view past videos and other resources online. You can join the LinkedIn group. And if you register for the course, just, one, just register one time online. Um, if you register every week, you'll get a newsletter for every single registration. So it will totally spam you, but we don't mean to. So just register once. The Upstart Competition. So the Upstart Competition um, is a really fun business competition. We're going to start in November. We'll announce it. We're going to provide a number of workshops that I call Entrepreneurship 201 to people who are interested. So we're going to give you some help before even you apply. Um, people, participants or interested parties can apply in early February. Uh, we'll have interviews with everybody. Uh, there'll be 10 individuals or teams that are picked to go on to work with Mars Market Intelligence and Mars advisors to sort of brush up their pitch. It's a great opportunity to spend two months, you know, with a deadline that kind of forces you to, to go farther and faster than, than you would otherwise. The competition is in May. It's a 10-minute pitch in front of investors, and there's a $15,000 uh, first prize, and we're working on upping a number of other prizes for that, so stay tuned. Eligibility. You have to be registered in Entrepreneurship 101. You have to have attended at least 20 sessions, so 20 stamps or 20 live webcasts or a combination of those. Um, it can be a business you've already started coming in, like today even. Um, it can be something that you start in November or December or January. Um, you have to do probably more work if you're just starting it out, but we've seen some early businesses win. Um, we do want it to be for new businesses, so we put a cap on that entrants must have received no more than 100000 in investment or 100000 in revenue. And I know that sounds like a lot to people starting out, but we've had online businesses just go whoosh. So we're like, oh, they're too big already. Um, and you have to fall into one of our categories because of the advisory services part portion. ICT, clean tech, social ventures, or life sciences. And you have to be located be located near one of our partners in the One Network because you have to work with an advisor in the One Network. So that could be GTA. We've got Hall Tech, Venture Lab in Markham, Rick Center in Mississauga, Communitech in Waterloo. So um, Innovation Factory in Hamilton, NORCAT in Sudbury. So any of those places, you're eligible for the competition if you can work with an advisor and, and want to come down to Mars in May. 
Um, some of the past winners, we've had some great past winners. Uh, this last winner was called Trendy Med. They invented a mobile IV infusion device. It was really, really cool. Um, I'm, we're really going to watch and see what happens with that company. 2012 Life Bike, it was a really lightweight, beautifully designed electric bike. Uh, 2011, we had a tie. It was a me uh, one was a cheap, very affordable medical device to test for STDs at home. So you can imagine something like that in Africa would really change the game. Um, the hot plate was a multimedia platform for quick, simple, affordable cooking. They made these cool, like, cooking videos. Shape Collage, automatic photo collage maker. Um, definitely check it out. It uh, sort of throws all your pictures into a collage, into shape. It's beautiful. DreamCube 2009, they're working with Apple on a UI remote, like a universal remote. Um, makes your iPhone into a universal remote. And we got it wrong in 2008. One of our um, successful companies that came from Mars got second in the upstart competition. Um, so I, I always say, you know, it's like Dragon's Den. They could get it wrong, you know. They were acquired by Intel in 2010. And they make these digital screens that are basically interactive. They can read who you are, what your demographics are. So they say, OK, male, I don't know, 18 to 25. And then it, the ad would change based on your demographics. So pretty um, interesting marketing, marketing materials. Other resources, check out the Entrepreneur's Toolkit. Uh, we made lots, we made about 500 articles. Um, Entrepreneurship 101 is also on there, so if you're really keen, you can watch all the videos from last year, download the slides, there's related resources there. Um, you can see this is the session 22 of 23. If you want to hear from VCs tomorrow, you can go and listen to what they said last year. Um, we just launched, I guess like a month ago, what's called the funding portal search tool on Mars. It, uh, it's, it's to search for funding sources. There are 30 billion in funding sources available on there. Definitely check it out, it has all kinds. Um, and another, another resource that I haven't mentioned that is actually one of, our, um, one of our big programs here at Mars is our workshops. So the workshops we're going to offer to people interested in the Upstart competition, they will help you, but they're also available for everybody um, along the way. And we'll have more materials next week on the, the upcoming dates. There are five of them. You don't have to take them in order. You can take what you need. The launching customer development one is the suggested first one. That's where we get, we get you um, to take, to make questions, interview questions, to go and ask your target market about the p problem and solution. So that's that get out of the building thing. Business strategy fundamentals covers value proposition and business model, so you'll build those. Pitching to investors, obviously a business plan, pitch deck. The Marcom toolkit um, helps you build a marketing strategy, and um, B2B sales process is about sales funnel and sales techniques. And we've just put them all together for the first time in something, we call it an intensive program, and it was wildly successful. It sold out in like, I don't know, three days, and we have 36 people on the waiting list. So if you're really interested, I actually recommend trying to get into the intensive program for the winter and do 12 weeks and do them all together. I think they're, these are really helpful because you're working in small groups. They're not lecture style. It's about building um, components for your business. And we have a new program launching in October 2013. If you're interested, we're offering uh, a certificate in entrepreneurship that we built with the University of Toronto, the School of Continuing Studies. This is just more um, in-depth than all our other programs. There are six courses, and they're, um, they're each five weeks long. And my last uh, topic is finding your idea. So we're going to play a video that, that is about from Stephen Johnson's book, Where Good Ideas Come From. For the past five years, I've been investigating this question of where good ideas come from. It's the kind of problem I think all of us are intrinsically interested in. We want to be more creative. We want to come up with better ideas. We want our organizations to be more innovative. I've looked at this problem from an environmental perspective. What are the spaces that have historically led to unusual rates of creativity and innovation? And what I've found in all of these systems, there are these recurring patterns that you see again and again that are crucial to creating environments that are unusually innovative. One pattern I call the slow hunch, that breakthrough ideas almost never come in a moment of great insight, in a sudden stroke of inspiration. Most important ideas take a long time to evolve, and they spend a long time dormant in the background. 
It isn't until the idea has had two or three years, sometimes 10 or 20 years to mature, that it suddenly becomes accessible to you and useful to you in a certain way. And this is partially because good ideas normally come from the collision between smaller hunches so that they form something bigger than themselves. So you see a lot in the history of innovation cases of, of someone who has half of an idea. There's a great story about the invention of the World Wide Web and Tim Berners-Lee. This is a project that Berners-Lee worked on for 10 years. But when he started, he didn't have a full vision for this new medium he was going to invent. He started working on one project as a side project to help him organize his own data. He scrapped that after a couple years, and he started working on another thing. And only after about 10 years did the full vision of the World Wide Web come into being. That is, more often than not, how ideas happen. They need time to incubate, and they spend a lot of time in this partial hunch form. The other thing that's important when you think about ideas this way is that when ideas take form in this hunch state, they need to collide with other hunches. Oftentimes, the thing that turns a hunch into a real breakthrough is another hunch that's lurking in somebody else's mind. And you have to figure out a way to create systems that allow those hunches to come together and turn into something bigger than the sum of their parts. That's why, for instance, the coffee house in the Age of the Enlightenment or the Parisian salons of, of modernism were such engines of creativity because they created a space where ideas could mingle and swap and create new forms. When you look at the problem of innovation from this perspective, it sheds a lot of important light on the debate we've been having recently about what the internet is doing to our brains. Are we getting overwhelmed with an always connected multitasking lifestyle? And is that going to lead to less sophisticated thoughts as we move away from the slower, deeper, contemplative state of reading? Obviously, I'm a big fan of reading. But I think it's important to remember that the great driver of scientific innovation and technological innovation has been the historic increase in connectivity and our ability to reach out and exchange ideas with other people and to borrow other people's hunches and combine them with our hunches and turn them into something new. That really has, I think, been, more than anything else, the primary engine of creativity and innovation over the last 600 or 700 years. And so, yes, it's true we're more distracted. But what has happened that is really miraculous and marvelous over the last 15 years is that we have so many new ways to connect and so many new ways to reach out and find other people who have that missing piece that will complete the idea we're working on or to stumble serendipitously across some amazing new piece of information that we can use to build and improve our own ideas. That's the real lesson of where good ideas come from. The chance favors the connected mind. What I like about that video is that it also sort of breaks the myth that you think that you're just going to come up with an idea and it's a, it's just an individual thing that happens. It is very much, um, there's other people involved, chance favors the connected mind. So that's sort of what we're trying to do at Mars by mixing different communities. But that's what we encourage our entrepreneurs to do is get out and talk about your ideas as well to sort of hone and refine them. Um, where ideas come from, they come from people who solve problems. A lot of the entrepreneurs, they, they had a problem, they developed a solution, and they created a product for it. They come from, they're developed and refined over time. They're not necessarily flashes of insight. They're often uh, two divergent parts that are reassembled in a new way. Um, they come through collaboration when you talk and listen to those around you, and when you ask questions when, and find the customer pro problem and then develop the solution. So why, why is now a good time to become an entrepreneur? The first reason is that entry barriers are lowered by technology. There's so many open source tools available online. We had uh, our future leaders were developing brands, their logos on the internet and getting funding. There's amazing tools available at your fingertips. 98% of startups are bootstrapped, so don't get intimidated by the whole investment sphere and trying to get investment and what investors want. Most startups are bootstrapped. They are, even Apple in the beginning from the ground up, it was bootstrapped. Um, you can reduce risk with customer develop and lean startups. So we'll talk more about what that looks like, but um, it can help you get to market faster and with fewer mistakes. There are so many communities to help. Obviously, there's Mars. There's tons of grassroots communities um, all over the province and, and many just in, in Toronto alone. 
Um, there's also decentralization of funding happening. So it's um, invest, investing, investment used to be kind of more formal and, and kind of a hidden market. But there's crowdsourcing, there's accelerators, there's impact investing. There's lots of things happening in the space that are making funding more accessible. And there's lots of tools and information online. In fact, there's so many tools and information online. Part of the, the challenge, especially in marketing, is you can learn how to do any kind of marketing tactic or execute anything, but there's nothing that can help you with strategy. So we can help you with strategy through workshops and advisors. Um, that's sort of the part that's, that's missing. Um, the tools and on how to execute are all online. So lastly, um, Thank you all for coming. I don't have time for questions publicly, but I, we will stay after Mary Al and myself to answer your questions. Pick up your attendance card on the way out, and to register, you just send the name and the card number to entrepreneurship101 at marsdd.com. And I just want to leave you with one last thought, that your dream job does not exist. You must create it. And we hope to see you next week. Thank you. Thank you.